Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea and China have a special relationship. The two countries are each other's only military alliance partners, and China is commonly seen as shielding North Korea from the discontent of the international community. But while this relationship started as an ideological alliance, and was forged in blood during the Korean War, it has seemingly become of a more pragmatic nature in recent years. In order to understand the history of Sino-North Korean relations better, we sat down with Professor John Delury. We talked about the pre-modern interactions between China and the Korean Peninsula, and the insights they hold for the situation today, about the distrust that has long characterized relations between China and North Korea, and about where the countries stand today with regards to each other. John Delury is Associate Professor of Chinese Studies at the Graduate School of International Studies of Yonsei University in Seoul. He completed his undergraduate and graduate studies in history at Yale University. In 2013, he published with Orville Schell the critically acclaimed Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century. Professor Delury's writings have appeared in various publications, including Foreign Affairs, 38 North, and Asian Perspective. He is also active on Twitter. Professor John Deliri, welcome to Korea and the World. Great, Alan. Yeah, good to be with you. To start off, what sparked your academic interest in East Asia, and what brought you to Korea? Well, it starts with China. I'm very much a China guy first and foremost, and only secondarily a Korea guy. And my interest in China started when I was a teenager. I grew up in California. There's a book that started it all, or maybe two books. Um, Somehow I stumbled on Thomas Merton, and so I started reading through Merton and sort of anything uh, that he touched. Merton led me to Zhuangzi, the ancient Chinese Taoist philosopher. So Merton had edited a translation of Zhuangzi. And that just kind of, you know, struck me like a, like a thunderbolt. That was it. I was at that age, Confucius says, you know, at 15, I set my will on learning. So I was, you know, that 15, 16, really looking for something. And I thought I found it. I still think Zhuangzi is about the best book out there of philosophy for me. Yeah, Zhuangzi was the beginning, Thomas Merton and Zhuangzi. That was all philosophical and and intellectual and identity somehow. Then in college, after my freshman year, I had a chance to go to China. So there was an experiential element that compounded, also confounded, the philosophical connection. So through reading Zhuangzi, I felt like there was something about the East, you know, that really spoke very directly to me. And then by going to Beijing... This was 1994. It's kind of post Tiananmen. Compared with now, no foreigners. I mean, very few foreigners. And I didn't speak a word of Chinese. So it was, in a way, the opposite experience from reading Zhuangzi in the comfort of suburban California, where I felt this connection. Now I was actually in Beijing and completely overwhelmed, didn't understand anything, but really wanted to figure it out very badly. And I suppose still felt some connection even though uncomprehending. (laughs) Those two experiences started me on the China quest that I'm still on. I still, every time I go to China, I'm kind of waiting to not be into it this time, you know, waiting for the air to just be so depressing and the experience to be so uninteresting. But thankfully, it hasn't happened. That's just the China part. I guess you're more interested in the Korea part, but they're connected. If China started with a book, Korea started with a person, with a woman who's now my wife, who happens to be from Seoul. And uh, we met in Beijing. Uh, She was teaching Korean language at the university, and I was studying. Uh, At that stage, I was doing my PhD in Chinese history. And then that started me on a much greater quest of marriage and family, but that also brought me to Korea. So, you know, I don't think I'm alone in this category, but that's, uh, it's important. First of all, my knowledge of Korea is much more limited than uh, my understanding of China is, though I have a long way to go there too. 
But I guess in a way, there's something more personal about Korea. And now we've been living here for five, almost six years. So actually, I have more time on the ground in Seoul, in South Korea. And then I suppose the last thing is North Korea, because North Korea also I came very late to. Uh, Again, there was a book. I had basically no interest in South Korea until I met my future wife. It was just not on my map. I was completely absorbed by China. That was more than enough to figure out. And then after I started coming to South Korea, I grew more and more interested. But still, North Korea didn't spark anything until one day when I started a new job. I was working in New York at uh, the Asia Society. And essentially, my first assignment was to take over from my boss, Orville Schell. And he was supposed to moderate a book talk by a guy, Mike Chinoy. And um, Mike had just written a great book called Meltdown, which was a very detailed, well-researched critique of North Korea policy in the mostly George W. Bush administration. So here I was, I, you know, I didn't know Mike Chinoy, I didn't know this book, I really didn't know North Korea. And, and Orville said, you know, I can't be here, Can you, this is a good guy, I'm sure it's a good book, can you do this event? I was still sort of out of graduate school, so I approached this book event like a, like a graduate student and read Mike's book backward and forward and checked his footnotes and, you know, kind of went all out. And it was a great experience and it really I couldn't stop from then. I became fascinated I suppose actually with U.S. policy toward North Korea, and then of course North Korea itself, and I got the chance to go to North Korea, so that spurred a whole other set of interests. A few years ago, you wrote that, and I quote, the road to Pyongyang now leads through Beijing. Could you explain what you meant by that? (laughs) I hope the structure of this interview is not going to be you reminding me of things I've written uh, or said since I'm not in the habit of rereading things. (laughs) So I have to take myself out of context. So I said, what, the road to Pyongyang leads through Beijing. Yes. Um, Well, I don't know what I meant (laughs) back when I wrote that, but I suppose it may be even more true uh, than when I said it. If we look in terms of what's going on just right now, I mean, we're speaking here in the immediate wake of North Korea's fourth nuclear test, which has catapulted them to the cover of the newspapers again, as they like. And, you know, that was, what, a week or two ago. And where are we in the response to that event and to the whole problem of how to deal with North Korea in terms of regional and international politics? We're talking about China. We're talking about U.S.-China relations. We're looking at Secretary of State Kerry's visit to Beijing and how did that go? And what, what were the Chinese willing or not willing to do to actually craft somehow a different response this time? So, you know, at least if we're talking about, and that probably was the context of that piece, if we're talking about addressing North Korea, the nuclear program, to be sure, but also actually the broader set of problems that it poses in terms of where's its place in this region, you know, these days the road does lie through Beijing. And part of that, I think, is a symptom of the United States, particularly in the Obama administration, kind of bowing out. I wrote a piece, which I do remember, I don't know if you're going to quote it, that was a sort of critique of the Obama administration's approach, maybe, uh, you know, a la Mike Chinoy, as I mentioned Mike. And it was really my attempt to figure out you know, what happened to Obama? How did he come up with the strategy he did? And the the term that I settled on was disengagement, that it's sort of intentionally disengaged. Uh, you know, American presidents have never liked to deal with North Korea, but some felt forced to. And Bill Clinton and even George W. Bush made some pretty serious efforts. But whether you like it or not, President Obama has been pretty consistent. He's not going to get engaged, even on the hardline side, really. So, with the United States disengaged even more, Beijing's role is primary. So that was probably the context I wrote it in then, and uh, I certainly think it's a valid way of analyzing where we are now in dealing with North Korea. It is often assumed that North Korea and China have a special, unique relationship. Where do you see the historic starting point of this relationship between North Korea and China? Well, that's a great question. Origins are, of course, you know, the essence of history. Where do things start? 
But it's also a perennial problem with history because there's never a true origin. Every origin is just a false origin. There's something else before that that you really need to know to understand. So with this question, when does this unique relationship between China and North Korea, when does it start? You know, we can find different starting points, but we're going to get dragged back deeper and deeper into the past. You know, as, as states, they formed right around the same time, post-World War II, in the late 1940s. So you could start it from then. But I think at minimum, you have to look beyond that and look at the histories of North Korean and Chinese communism as um, movements, maybe is the best concept, since as a party, North Korea didn't have as much of a history as an organized party. But the Chinese communists, of course, were organized as a party from 1921 and actually really adopted many, I guess you could say, most Korean communists into their party structure. So you could go back to that. You could go back to the founding of, of the Chinese Communist Party and then the party relationships. Or maybe, again, a better concept is movements, you know, the history of these two communist movements, which were deeply uh, entangled with one another in that area that we can call Manchuria, which is the mixing ground of China and Korea. But as a historian, you want to keep going back further, you know. So when I teach a course here on China-Korea relations, and also I did a, a very fun experiment in online teaching. I did a MOOC course with Future Learn, And uh, with those courses, I start with the Imjin War in the late 1590s, which again is an artificial start, but it at least gets us back to imperial times, to the dynastic period. There's no North and South Korea. It's just Korea. It's Choson. But I do think that background is essential to seeing some of the kind of deepest layer of the foundations um, or even under the foundations of this unique relationship between China and North Korea. So, you know, I think some of my colleagues would say, oh, only Choson, you know, and late Ming. My God, you got to go deeper than that. So I stop there. I stop in, in 1590s. So how do you think the Imjin Wars are related to the relationship between North Korea and China? I'll tell you one concept that you can watch in action during the Imjin War that I think is still helpful, even though today Chinese and North Koreans would never refer to it in the context of describing their own relationship. But that's this notion of sade, uh, shi da in Chinese which I suppose is best translated as serving the great. This is a concept that, you know, in many ways, it was the paradigm for China's relationship with other smaller countries, neighboring countries, but especially with Korea, with Choson Korea. It's an ancient idea, you know, I mean, I always say with China, any good concept goes back 2,500 years, uh, which is true of this one. So it's a very old concept, but It was a sort of ideal for what the relationship should be like between China and Korea. And sometimes it's misunderstood, even if we've heard of it at all, because of that translation and the focus just on serving the great. What that refers to is a set of obligations that the smaller country, Korea in this case, owes to the greater country. But actually the key to that concept to that paradigm for their relationship was it's not just serving the great, it's also shi xiao, serving the small. So China was under a set of obligations toward Choson Korea as a kind of protector, as a great power. It had to care for and even defend the interests of the smaller country. So in a way, they're kind of captive of one another. You know, You could almost say it's a Chinese concept of alliance, of something, you know, Americans love. Americans love alliances. And we say Chinese don't have allies, with the one exception of North Korea. But this Sade concept, it's an alliance paradigm. What's instructive about the Imjin War, and often, unfortunately, wars in general, is the tremendous stress of conflict and large-scale violence and destruction, and the kind of organization that has to go into both defensive and offensive warfare when two countries are involved in it. That stress historically is kind of like a spotlight. 
that allows us to see some things that might be hidden from view in peacetime. I think Thucydides made that point <laughs> better than me a long time ago. So you get that with the Imjin War. You see the leaders and you know the elites of the Chinese and the Koreans re referring to this ideal of how they're supposed to relate to one another. But then you also see all of the uh, misgivings they have, all of the distrust, all of the doubts that they constantly have toward one another, that they're being manipulated or used or that their interests, in fact, don't align. And each sees the other as fighting the war in a way that works for that side, but not for their collective interest. And that, I think, is a, a theme that plays out very well in looking at PRC and DPRK, the history since 1948-49 when they were founded as states, and plays out very well now. I mean, we're actually, I'm sure we'll get to this, but we're in a very interesting moment, I think. It's not wartime, thank God, but we're seeing a lot of stresses, probably because of leadership transition in PRC and DPRK to Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. So their relationship is under a great deal of stress, and you can see elements of that kind of old paradigm. There's an ideal of how they're supposed to behave toward one another. It's mutual and reciprocal. They're both under a set of obligations. But then there's all kinds of distrust and even distaste. They don't necessarily like each other. So you don't have to study the Imjin War to get what's going on now, but it's rather interesting. Did we see that Sade relationship between North Korea and the PRC during the Korean War? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, there are better, much better historians, and hopefully you've interviewed them already or will, who are true experts on the Korean War. And so I would defer to them. But I think in some general sense, the Korean War experience put that kind of stress on the relationship and the issue of who's really in charge here, the resentment that both sides felt toward one another, the resentment, for example, between Kim Il-sung and the Chinese military commander, Peng De Huai, um, which was kind of barely disguised, but which was also, of course, an incredible tension between Mao Zedong, the political leader of China, and Kim Il-sung. You see a lot of evidence of that in the Korean War, but at the same time, they can't openly, you know, they're allies fighting a war together, you know, so they, they can't openly sort of confess to that or acknowledge that, they have to keep up a united front, more than a united front, an alliance relationship for the public eye, but even almost psychologically amongst themselves. I think that that peculiar alliance relationship that PRC and DPRK have, yes, you see it sort of right out of the gates in the fighting of the Korean War and the degree of tension that's there in the way that they fight together. North Korea's insistence not to really let go control to China, and yet China's completely saved North Korea. The North Koreans get wiped off the face of the earth there without the Chinese intervening, but the North Koreans never want to see it that way uh, at the time or subsequently. So I think, um, again, there are echoes of Imjin War in that Korean War experience, and it's something we still see in the mixture of the relationship subsequent even to today. Why was Mao so determined to stand by Kim Il-sung during the war? While the estimates differ, they are at least way more than a half a million Chinese who were either killed or wounded during the war, and that includes one of Mao's son. Yeah, that's right. I mean, historians still, we've gotten more insights into this over the years, but I would say it's still historiographically a place of interesting debate where there are different interpretations. And I think, you know, China's entry into the Korean War the amount of resources that Mao committed to the war, including, as you say, his own son who was killed. Those are complex decisions, also not made alone by Mao. Particularly then, Mao, although he was paramount leader, had to convince others at the senior levels of the party and of the military. So it's not entirely a question of what did Mao think, what did Mao want, and then just boom, there it is. He does have to think in terms of at that very top echelon of the, the leadership. He has to persuade to some extent, and there were a lot of misgivings about it. And then, of course, he has to think about his masses. Again, particularly then, this is a leader who we would probably argue did have his finger on the pulse 
of a lot of Chinese people, at least peasants. You know, that's part of the way we have to explain how he got there in the first place to power. So this is someone who, again, at particularly at that stage, was attuned to what do the Chinese people want? And maybe he's going to more and more tell them what they want. But still, he's thinking about what do our people want? And, you know, from the perspective of Chinese history, from the perspective of Mao and the leadership, it's an extraordinary moment when they decide to fight in Korea simply because of the opportunity cost, which is Taiwan. This is a moment in 1950 where the Civil War, we teach as a historian, we all teach the Chinese Civil War was from 1945 to 1949. But a revisionist historian, I think, could muster a pretty good argument to say the Civil War is not over in 1949. It, you know, it's in a lull. And we call it over because we know the Kuomintang on Taiwan are never going to be able to make another shot at the mainland. And actually, I've been researching this period, and, and scholars have done good work on this. There are, there are still large-scale, call them uprisings, but really they're not even uprisings. They're just the civil war not being over in large swaths of uh, the country, particularly in the, in the southernmost part of China in 1950, even 1951. And uh, so, you know, here is Mao, here's the leadership. They've just finally won this struggle for decades of surviving as a movement, surviving as a party, and then surviving Japan, surviving the Kuomintang, clawing their way to the top, standing up on Tiananmen Square balustrade, Mao saying, here we are, we've stood up, we've got a state, I have a country now. And, you know, the next thing they've got to do is go off to Korea to fight someone else's war, essentially, before they've finished off their own true enemy, before they've really won their revolution and their civil war and defeated Chiang Kai-shek, defeated the Nationalist Party, and brought Taiwan into the PRC. So I guess I'm still thinking this through a lot myself and reading the interpretations of wonderful historians. I mean, a couple have just popped to mind. Chen Jian has done, of course, great stuff on this. Shen Zhihua is extraordinary and is still coming up with new ideas and, and uncovering new documents. Those are just two. There are more who are thinking about this question. But I, I suppose what I would stress is, you know, there may not be a sort of silver bullet answer. It was a very complex decision. And again, I would stress from a Chinese perspective, the bar is very high to justify going into Korea when at some level the opportunity cost is Taiwan. So I guess what it shows us is in Mao's calculation and ultimately in the party's calculation, something vital, vital interest was at stake, more critical, more important, even than really finally winning the civil war. So that has to make you think, and some historians would argue this, that at a most basic level, Mao sees his survival, the survival of the state and his regime and the party, newborn thing, at stake. If he doesn't fight this war in Korea, then he'd lose that. There are other interpretations. He needed to keep the tension and energy of mass mobilization going so that he didn't lose any of that steam that he wanted as a revolutionary. There are very cynical theories that it was a form of demobilization and denationalistification. You've pretty much won the civil war, but you've got all these recently ex Guomindang soldiers, young guys roaming around. The economy's not gonna give them great jobs anytime soon. What do you do? You send them off to get killed basically in Korea. And there's some good evidence of that in terms of where particular units were recruited from parts of the country where they're basically recruiting ex-Guomindang. And then these guys get mowed down. I mean, we know enough about the war itself. And you look at any American account, Americans who fought in the war, one similarity you see in all the accounts is just, just astonished at these human waves, the losses that the Chinese would take. Now, maybe they're fitting it into this notion of they don't value the individual, so they're predisposed to think this, but I think there's enough evidence to show that that's going on too. But is that the cause? I mean, does Mao convince the leadership and they go along with the idea, we have to get involved in Korea so that we can kill off 
the ex-national soldiers, that's kind of hard to believe. But it's a complex decision where you have a lot of factors that come together to make that call. Both Kim Il-sung and North Korean communists fought against the Japanese colonial army in China. Was there a sense of responsibility, a sense of gratitude that played a part in this decision? Yeah, well, again, on the list of factors, brotherhood, solidarity, repaying pretty recent debts goes on that list. The North Koreans, Koreans or Korean Chinese, whatever you want to call them, had been incorporated militarily into Chinese communist units for quite a while. Kim Il-sung himself had fought you could say essentially in a Chinese uniform, except they didn't wear uniforms per se since they were guerrillas, but he was fighting under a Chinese command structure. There are other ways in which the Koreans, the North Korean communists, had basically contributed to and helped out Mao and the the Chinese, or that they were sort of somehow part of one thing. So again, I would put that on the list of factors. I would also be a little skeptical that that is something we could isolate as sort of the primary factor mostly because of Taiwan, mostly because of the fact that the Chinese Civil War is not really over, resolved. I'm skeptical that Mao had it in him and the leadership had it in them to do this because they kind of felt they should, because they owed something to the North Koreans. But it goes on the list. It goes on the list of here's another reason to be involved. You know, I'd say another element that's that's some extent at play there, which again, some historians stress, is Mao's aspirations for, we could even say some kind of great power status, that Mao's ambitions for China as a player, as a global player, you see over the course of his rule post-49, you see those ambitions are quite unwieldy, sometimes out of proportion to the resources that he has. Sometimes he plays a pretty good hand to make China a global player, even though, say, economically, it's very weak. It's nothing like, say, China today. But he has those ambitions. And so another line of interpretation is that, you know, in a way, Mao can't resist the temptation of getting out there, of fighting outside of uh, his borders, and of taking on, of all powers, taking on the United States, taking on one of the two newly emergent superpowers, even showing up the Soviets by stepping in in a way that Stalin hesitated and it didn't step in. Mao steps into the breach and the Chinese kind of march on to, uh, to the global stage and fight off the Americans, fight the Americans to a truce. One senses that was deeply gratifying to Mao and in line with you know, his aspirations, his vision. This is kind of the nationalist part of Mao, not, not communist per se. So again, that's maybe related, but a separate point really on this list of, of reasons to cross the Yalu. From the 1960s, the two great powers of the communist bloc, China and the Soviet Union, split apart over differences and were actually on the brink of war towards the end of the 60s. How did North Korea react, and how did it impact the relationship between China and North Korea? Well, the, the Sino-Soviet split is it's a great way of explaining probably the core foreign relations strategy of Kim Il-sung, which is in Korean, Juche, usually translated as self-reliance in English. But, you know, sort of the, as many have pointed out, uh, maybe the best, most recent is Charles Armstrong in his great recent book, Tyranny of the Weak, which is a history of North Korea's foreign relations for the Cold War era. You know, the great irony of this self-reliance motto is Kim Il-sung is alternately relying heavily (laughs) on one of two patrons. And in a weird way, it works out great for Kim Il-sung that they hate one another. It's sort of like being best friends with the two coolest kids in your high school who are of warring factions and hate one another. And, and you're the one person who's best friends with both of them. And so Kim Il-sung is quite adept at manipulating that situation. And it's sort of leaning back and forth from Moscow to Beijing and playing that hand. And of course, he has to be careful because inevitably he'll piss one, of, one or the other of them off. But he's really able to play that through the Cold War. And this split, the Sino-Soviet split, 
we can basically date from 1959 is usually kind of the official start date. And then it pretty much ends extraordinarily when Gorbachev visits Beijing in 1989. So it's really the large chunk of the Cold War is you have this great power rivalry, the schism between the two communist powers. And North Korea has got borders with each and deep relationships with each. And Kim Il-sung has deep relationships with both. And so he does play them off pretty effectively and preserve his regime, squeeze what benefits he can from it. And I, again, I think Charles Armstrong is probably the best at, at describing that for people who want to go deeper. I think, you know, insofar as North Korea, like other countries, has continuity in its foreign relations and is, is a kind of organism, a learning organism, and has a certain repertoire or remembers things and tries them again, especially given that it's hereditary and you've got a grandfather, a father, and a son who have run the place since the 40s, you know, I think that that is part of the repertoire. And it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of an alliance with a high degree of distrust, even distaste. You know, I mean, think about this from the Chinese side, whether you're Mao or then Deng, you've got this ally, your only formal treaty ally, defense treaty ally, who's constantly you know, flirting with the enemy in terms of the Soviets and constantly playing back and forth. And of course, the Chinese saw what the North Koreans were doing. They're just kind of limited in what they could do back, which sounds familiar, doesn't it? So as far as this notion of some seed of distrust that is always there, that's another one from a Chinese perspective. This is a unreliable ally, although I think Chinese analysts and diplomatic historians coldly look at this and say, yeah, we kind of get it. You know, they're acting in their self-interest. It's smart in a way. It, it makes sense. But you can't really like it from a Chinese perspective. In 1972, U.S. President Nixon made his famous trip to China, which would become the first step in the normalization of relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China. How did North Korea react to what must have seemed like its ally making a deal with the devil? Right. I mean, this is the uh, so-called Nixon shock. You know, this was a shockwave throughout East Asia. This was shocking in the United States when a great commie hater, Republican Richard Nixon, suddenly shows up on national television, you know, toasting Zhou Enlai and Mao Zedong. So there was a Nixon shock that was quite successful in the end in the United States. But then there was also a regional, an Asian Nixon shock. It was confounding for a lot of countries in the region and uh, both South Korea and North Korea, right, for inverse reasons. So one way that the North Koreans responded was actually it sparked, I suppose, the first serious probe between North and South, or it's at least part of that kind of preliminary attempt that, of course, the Pak chung era, the current president's father was dictator in South Korea. And so Kim Il-sung and Pak chung created this rare moment of secret talks and even the, the first inter-Korean sort of joint declaration, you know, the first attempt to say, ah, maybe we should get along and ultimately we all want to reunify this place. So that's one example of a kind of scramble that both Koreas made, that the whole region made to this kind of shocking realignment. Again, to our sort of central theme here of distrust, it is, again, now here from a North Korean perspective, it's one of these markers of, okay, we cannot rely on these guys to carry water for us. Another thing, I think if you look into the diplomatic record of it, the Chinese were very aware that this is going to be a tough sell in Pyongyang. And so they look for ways to sort of let the North Koreans know, you know, or explain it away and kind of hold the hand and comfort Pyongyang after the fact, which again is a trope of the relationship. They are making decisions coldly on their perceived national self-interest. But then either right before or after the fact, they switch back to shi da shi xiao, you know, serving the great, serving the small, and make these efforts to sort of, oh, well, we're not completely selling you down the river, you know, and here's how it's going to work out. 
So you see a little bit of that scrambling on both sides. From the end of the 1970s, Deng Xiaoping brought China on a far less ideological, a way more pragmatic course than in the decades before. How did North Korea receive this gradual change away from the communist ideal? Well, I think the North Koreans, you know, were scratching their heads for a while. And you don't get the sense, at least in, the, in what I've seen of the, what we can get of the diplomatic record between Deng Xiaoping and Kim Il-sung. You know, there are these wonderful tapes you can watch on KCNA YouTube of heroic North Korean voices and showing them hugging one another and having such a great time and lighting each other's cigarettes and all that. So they could certainly put up the show again of the alliance. But you kind of counterpoise that with, I remember there's one of these great documents put together by the Woodrow Wilson School's Cold War History Project. And there's a subset of that, the North Korea International Documentation Project, which I guess, I don't know who your listeners are, but I'm guessing they're the kind of people who know this already. And I always use it for teaching. It's just a wonderful resource because it's a lot of good raw material. It's primary sources that the Woodrow Wilson School researchers and their teams have translated from all kinds of languages. A lot of these are documents from East European countries who opened up their archives after the fall of Berlin Wall, after the fall of the Soviet Union. So they make these available very easily on their website in English. And I'm pretty sure it's from one of those. I haven't looked at this in a while, but I believe it's a discussion between Kim Il-sung and Eric Honecker, the East German president. And they start talking about China. And um, as I remember this, you'd have to look at it. Someone out there listening can Google this. But there's this very interesting passage where Kim Il-sung talks a bit about China. And the phrase I remember, because I wrote a little piece on this, was he says, we're sort of worried that they're not sticking with socialism. You know, And this was, I think, maybe mid-80s, 84. So Kim Il-sung is aware that, of course, by 84, it's, it's, it's hard to miss. So they're aware Deng is doing something very, very different with the economy. But at that stage, he's still sort of confiding to his East German friend who he got along with to say, what's really going on with him? You know, I mean, politically and ideologically, where is this heading? And we hope Deng doesn't take this too far. That's sort of Kim Il-sung's attitude. So I find that to be a revealing. There's, I sense a little bit of sort of scratching his head still at that point of what is Deng up to. And then you've got the Chinese side of all this. And if the North Koreans are kind of scratching their head at what is Deng up to, after a little bit further down the road, Deng and the Chinese are pulling their hair out, saying, why don't the North Koreans get this, you know, and get their act together? Now, that's especially the case after the Cold War and, and after the death of Kim Il-sung. Then we get into pulling the hair out, uh, which maybe we're still in that phase. But it's quite interesting to watch that. The divergence between systems occurs after the death of Mao, when Deng takes China in this other direction while, of course, keeping Communist Party monopoly in power, very securely keeping that, and keeping weirdly the ideology somehow of communism, and yet utterly transforming the economy and the social structure and, and the mores, whereas North Korea sticks with socialism to use Kim Il-sung's phrase, with the kind of unreconstructed mixture. Sticks with that even after everyone, pretty much, except Cuba, I suppose, abandons it. And so watching that divergence is very interesting. In a sense, it's still there. The Chinese are often looking for reconvergence. There are many Chinese who watch North Korea, know something about North Korea, think, well, it could be, could be around the corner, when very belatedly, the North Koreans finally get what Deng was up to and figure out how to implement it in their own way, in their own country. Professor Andrew Leinkoff, whom we spoke to in our previous episode, made the argument that today, the relationship between China and North Korea might actually be getting tighter, mainly because of the result of a growing rivalry between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Do you agree? And do you see that as an evolution of the SADE a relationship that exists between China and North Korea? The transition has been very rocky into the Xi Jinping era in China and the Kim Jong-un era uh, in North Korea. 
And the two leaders have not figured out a way to get along. You know, there have been times where you wonder if they're going to pull down the drapes, you know, of this alliance. Not that China would abandon North Korea or or push North Korea, uh, support South Korean absorption or any of those delusions. But I mean just that they wouldn't even keep up the nice language about one another. That hasn't happened. They've kept up the boilerplate stuff. And then the first real turn of a corner was in the second half of last year, maybe after the agreement in August here between the two Koreas, where in my estimation, Beijing made a move, presumably that has to be authorized by Xi Jinping, to say, okay, let's really repair this relationship, not just with North Korea, but specifically with Kim Jong-un. And so the manifestation of that that we saw very dramatically was when a, a Politburo Standing Committee member, Liu Yunshan, went and was up at the, the balustrade with Kim Jong-un for the October parade, and they held hands high in the air and, and that sort of love fest. So it looked like that fell apart because you had the Morambong music troupe that mysteriously fled Beijing just at the beginning of what was supposed to be this great cultural exchange. And now most recently have had a fourth nuclear test, which the Chinese are on record not wanting the North Koreans to do. Maybe soon we're going to have another satellite or missile test. And yet, so far, Beijing has been quite restrained in its response. And there's not a sign of Xi Jinping taking this personally. So, you know, maybe the most important document is that letter that she wrote to Kim Jong-un and gave his envoy, Liu Yunshan, to deliver in person. If you look at the text of that letter, which the Chinese put up on Xinhua and their state media, what's remarkable to me about it is it's very personal and direct to Kim Jong-un. It explicitly affirms the legitimacy of a de facto dynastic succession process and sort of says, you, Kim Jong-un, are the rightful ruler. And I am recognizing that. And let's kind of work together. My sense of this is she is going to kind of stick with that decision. He's made his call, which is I'm going to be big here. And I'm going to give this guy a lot of room because he evidently needs it. And also, I'm not going to get all worked up over another nuclear test and going to kind of wait for him to come around. That seems to be where we are, but it's unclear where this is heading. And there has not been yet... Um, well, Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un have not had their bond yet. Obviously, they need to get in a room together somewhere. They need to start to resume the long tradition of paramount leader bonding sessions that Kim Jong-il had all the way till his death with the senior Chinese leaders and that, of course, Kim Il-sung had with Deng Xiaoping with Mao before. So until we see Xi and Kim Jong-un in the flesh, you know, and watch how that plays out. Um, hesitant to say we're not yet in the kind of next era of the relationship. To conclude, last summer, Professor Robert Kelly, whom we interviewed in one of our first episodes, wrote the following about the relationship between China and North Korea. Right now, that relationship is the coldest it has ever been. That is awesome. We really, really want this. The day China cuts off North Korea is the day the countdown to North Korea's implosion begins. Is a collapse of that sad relation between North Korea and China something we should be hoping for, you think? No, we should not be hoping for a collapse of North Korea triggered by China bringing the country to its knees. And I think the reason for that is, if you think through that scenario, Given North Korea's history, the way they are set up, you're imagining a bloody, destructive implosion that very likely produces just another version of the DPRK, maybe even still with the name DPRK. Maybe you've taken Kim Jong-un out of the equation. But Kim Jong-un is not the problem here. The system is the problem, and the way the system relates to neighboring countries to the region and to the world. That's the problem. That's what you have to change. I mean, look, there are different views on this. There are different assessments. And I understand 
I, I just have a different one. There are people who, for their own good reasons, for objective reasons, think that the North Korean regime just can't survive. It inevitably has to collapse. And, uh, you know, they'll often cite the Soviet Union and say, no one thought the Soviet Union would collapse until it collapsed. And so that's logically coherent, and there are good facts to support it, given weaknesses, most obviously the economic weakness of North Korea. So it's a real dividing line, that presupposition of sort of how close are they to collapse, and what would it take to just knock them off. That's a big difference, maybe the most critical one, because I have a very different starting point, in part influenced by the fact that I do come to Korea from China. And, you know, people have been studying China. What we have to explain is the opposite of the Soviet problem. We have to explain not how did none of us see this thing collapsing. Rather, how come we thought this was going to collapse for so long and it still hasn't? And it doesn't look like it's about to. And, you know, people don't predict the collapse of China anymore. Cause there are a couple of people out there. But we still obsessively predict the collapse of North Korea and imagine it's kind of a switch that there's a room in Beijing that connects to oil pipelines. And if one day she would just flip that switch, the oil shuts off, the whole thing stops, and all the North Koreans led by Kim Jong-un, you know, walk out of their bunkers with their hands up and say, okay, Park Geun-hye, it's all yours. I'm not being fair, but I do think that I'm entirely unpersuaded by the collapse and absorption scenarios that are out there. And I, I guess more importantly than what I think is Chinese I talk to are not persuaded by those. I mean, recently one Chinese interlocutor, we were chatting about other things and he said, well, you, you know, you're seeing what's going on in Syria. You get why we talk about stability in North Korea? And you can pick apart that analogy too. But the point is the Chinese first of all, don't see North Korea as just on the precipice of collapse. They don't think it has an ideology that will inevitably crumble, since in some measure they share that ideology and system. And they're certainly not about to take a risk and cause pretty extreme pain on North Koreans, risking almost an inevitable effort by North Korea to not walk out of their bunkers with their hands up, but to go down with their guns blazing and lash out with pretty formidable capabilities militarily in every direction. On Seoul here, where we're within artillery range, all along 800-mile border with China, Japan, you know, you name it. You know, the Chinese don't want to take that risk. And frankly, I'm dubious about how many Americans really want to take that risk when you start to think it through. I think, again, it goes back to a basic difference in premise. If you think North Korea is very weak, is on a lifeline from China, and all it would take is one little nudge, and the whole thing just goes away, and South Korea can move in, then that logic makes sense. But that's not my assessment. And again, more importantly, I know very few Chinese who look at it that way. People can hope for it. It's fine. But if you think the road is through Beijing to make that so-called contingency actually happen then your road is blocked because they don't want to go down that road. Professor Delery, thank you so much for your time. It's been fun, Alan. I really uh, appreciate the chance to talk and there's a great set of questions. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.